Oh, and for dinner, my mom got you chicken. What? Why? Because you're Jewish? Okay, but what does that have to do with ham and Easter? I don't know. It's not kosher, is it? But how am I supposed to know? Because you're Jewish? Oh, well, yeah, but I'm not that Jewish. Oh, oops. Oops. And we say this in your name. Or whose ever name you pray to. Amen. Amen. Hi, my name is Alyssa, and I am Jewish. Uh, no you're not. You're pasty white with red hair. Listen, Buster, I may look like a hot and kissable version of Pennywise, but that doesn't mean I'm not Jewish. But you don't look Jewish. Your hair isn't curly, your eyes aren't dark, you you n- No, go on, say it. Uh, y- your nose isn't big and hooked over. Correct. I don't look like your typical animated villain character. And I would argue no Jewish person looks like that. Only propaganda looks like that. Wait, so does that mean- I'll let you Google that one. Jewish people can be any skin color, speak any language, and live all over the world, just like Christians, Muslims, Hindus, or any religious group. But I understand where your confusion is coming from. Jewish people are considered an ethno-religious group of people. When someone says they're Jewish, they could mean they go to a temple for religious services, they were taught to speak Hebrew or Yiddish, and they observe Jewish holidays, cultures, and traditions. Or they could simply identify with and participate in their Jewish heritage and community in their own secular way, so without the religious stuff. And there's also a huge gray area in between, because everyone's different. But no matter how they may express themselves, your Jewish friend probably knows the best place in town to get a bagel. And no matter what you think of them and their lifestyle, they are still Jewish. Which is still confusing, I know. Take it from me. I grew up Jewish. Emphasis on the ish, though. Once upon a time, my parents both wore yellow to find each other on their first date. A blind date. My mom was Christian, and my dad was Jewish. Well, dad didn't have, like, a bar mitzvah. You know, that religious coming-of-age celebration for Jewish kids? The chair thing? Oh, yeah, the chair thing! Yeah, my dad didn't do that. Aw, oh, man. I know, right? That looks so fun. Anyway, if I had to guess why, it would probably be as a result of cultural assimilation. Assimilation is where an immigrant or their family lineage is pressured to disregard their heritage and instead adopt the culture, language, even political ideology of the country they've moved to, usually to blend in and avoid getting targeted. Of course, this only goes so far. For example, if you're an Ethiopian Jew and you have dark skin, you'll be racialized or assumed to just be black when arriving to the United States. Versus if you're a Scandinavian Jew and your skin is pale, you'll be racialized or assumed to just be white. And although my home country of the United States is known as a melting pot of cultures, it's undeniable that how you look will gravely affect how others treat you. By this I mean my grandfather, so my dad's dad, was able to have a typical Jewish upbringing. He learned Hebrew, he lit the menorah, he was bar mitzvahed. (gasps) He got to do the chair thing? Yeah, but he was also drafted by the U.S. military to serve in World War II. Oh, the one with... Yeah, the one with Germany. Fun fact, when my grandfather served, there was only a priest and a church for Christian religious services, no temples or rabbis for Jews like him. But it was highly encouraged that everyone in the army attend church. So he, a Jewish man, attended Christian church to blend in, to assimilate. Why didn't he just not go? No one was making him. Well, sure, no one forced him to go to church. They didn't need to. The social pressure for simply being the only Jewish person in a sea of Christian people during a particularly tumultuous time was all it took. And the vocab word for this is called Christian hegemony. Hegemony? Hold on. Christian hegemony. Christian hegemony. Hegemony. All right. And I don't know about you, but if I survive something like that, I'd be hesitant to raise my family outwardly expressing their Jewish heritage. World War II may have ended a long time ago, but those ideologies are still very much alive and active today. But I'll get into that later. Because it's not like this Jewish heritage was hidden from my dad. He always knew he was Jewish. His friends did too. That's how he ended up getting elected as president of his friend's B'nai chapter. Wait, what? I can't. Yes, you can. You're Jewish. Well, yeah, but I don't go to church. Temple. Temple. Sorry. But still, why me? Well, Ethan's flunking math, Mitch is still on the teacher's bad side for flirting with Erica every day in second period, and I'm still grounded for sneaking out. But your record is clean. Wh- what about Morty? He's, he's a good kid. He can't. He's Catholic. What? Then why is he here? 
He's the only one who can drive, duh. My dad accepted this position at first. After all, he ran unopposed. <laughs> but he resigned soon after. Because as he told me, he felt like a fraud. He didn't grow up doing the typical Jewish things like his dad or his friends did. He couldn't even speak Hebrew. And my dad told me this feeling has followed him his whole life. When he and my mom were about to get married, he was scared that marrying a Christian would mean, quote, turning his back on his heritage. So to honor my dad's heritage, his father said a Jewish prayer in Hebrew to bless their marriage, in addition to the regular American and Christian wedding traditions. It was definitely not orthodox. It was probably not kosher. But if you ask me, I don't think that makes my dad any less Jewish than his dad. And although he had never really been in any kind of religious setting until he met my mom, my dad was open to trying it out. Like I said, my mom was Christian, Lutheran to be exact, which is basically a spinoff of Catholicism because a guy named Mart had 99 problems, but the Pope was not going to be one, baby. He's starting his own church. My dad told me he converted to Lutheranism so my brother and I would be raised under one faith. That way, he could fill in the blanks on our Jewish heritage if we were ever confused. And he tried his best. I'll give him that. But honestly, there were so many holidays and I couldn't keep track, so I just smiled and nodded and ate the little chocolate coins he gave me, and the rest is history. Wow. So despite your parents' differences in their upbringing, love really does conquer all. Yeah. Um, that's what I thought too, but it's so nice to meet you. What happened to Aubrey? I liked her. So yeah, Grandma Cell did not like my mom from the moment they met. And it didn't help that my mom accidentally spilled apple juice on her floor that night, and the stain never came out, no matter how hard she scrubbed it. And from then on, Grandma Cell took every opportunity to say horrible things to my mother until the day she died. Grandma, I mean. And may she rest in peace. But also, that's kind of petty. Like, really petty. It just didn't make sense. That is, until I started doing my own research on Judaism and my family's heritage. But sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Because how did I go from confirming my faith in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at the ripe old age of 11 to lighting my first menorah in 2020? Well, it all started when I was doxxed. Doxing is when people find personal and sensitive information about you and publish it with the intent to intimidate, harass, and harm you and or the people in your life. This happens to a lot of YouTubers, unfortunately. I'm not the only one. And this happened to me while I was outside of the US visiting Japan in late 2018. And to say that this was the worst possible time this could happen would be an understatement. Let it be known, I did call the police, but... They had never heard of doxing, they didn't know what I was talking about, and they insinuated I was prank calling them, so nothing was done about it. I couldn't file any charges or submit a report. Um, it also took 48 hours for YouTube to not suspend the account, but give them one strike, and here are my emails. Um, I never heard back from them, and it's been years. So what does this have to do with me being Jewish? Well. A certain subsection of people who don't like me or my videos, not all Illimation dislikers, just a subsection of them that I hope is small, identify as... how do I put this? They don't like how World War II ended, and so if a Jewish person exists today and is happy or successful, these people think it's because being Jewish is actually a front for being a member of a secret society that controls the banks, the news, the entertainment industry, and anything they can slap a stereotype on, really, because they believe Jews are trying to take over the world and they must be stopped. Therefore, when my YouTube channel took off and all these people found out I had a drop of Jewish blood in me, they felt I was part of a grand conspiracy and thus I needed to be erased. And they still do. Yeah, this was news to me too. Surprise! <laughs> but after about two years of therapy, I realized, how is it that a group of strangers who want me and my family dead care more about my Jewish heritage than I do? That's not fair. It's my heritage. And you can't have it. So, after rigging Animal Crossing New Horizons of all the serotonin I could amidst the 2020 lockdown, I began researching Judaism to learn more about myself. 
And one of the first things I learned was, according to Orthodox Jewish standards, a child is only Jewish if their mother is Jewish. So either the mother has a Jewish mother, or the mother must convert to Judaism. Otherwise, her kid's not Jewish, even if the father is. Which made the Juice of 87 incident make a lot more sense. Perhaps my grandma resented her daughter-in-law, not because of an apple juice stain on the linoleum, but due to the absence of this orthodox standard in the family tree. A family tree that, from her perspective, would now end with my dad. When I learned this, part of me started to worry that this meant I wasn't actually Jewish, or I was horribly appropriating my dad's culture, or worst of all, I got doxxed for nothing? But the next thing I learned couldn't have come at a better time. One day, while sitting in on a Shabbat service over Zoom, one of the members played guitar and sang a song called Lador Fador, which means from generation to generation in Hebrew. It's a Jewish phrase that refers to passing on our traditions, culture, and history from one generation to the next, like lighting one candle and sharing its flame eternally. And I immediately thought back to when my dad would show me how to play dreidel, and all the times we made matzo ball soup together. Even back to when he tried explaining another Jewish holiday, while I stared at him, blank-faced, eating gelt. I didn't know it until I heard that song, but all that he did, that was the door of a door. And sure, I didn't know a lick of Hebrew, and neither did he, but he still taught me about our family, and what it meant to be Jewish, no matter what anyone, including his own mother, would say. He didn't let the light go out. And it was in that moment, hearing that song, that I truly felt connected to my heritage for the first time. Since then, I've been slowly learning more and more about myself and, of course, making more and more Jewish friends, who also struggle with this. I thought it was just a me thing. Thankfully, those who would argue that I'm not actually Jewish are a super small group of people that I have yet to meet. And though I can empathize with where they're coming from, I feel like the world has changed and gotten a lot bigger, more complex. More importantly, I feel like there are issues we should be coming together on. Because I can assure you, an Orthodox Jewish person's lack of validation of my heritage isn't going to stop people like me, patrilineal Jewish people, from getting hate-crimed. Hate like this has always been a problem. It didn't go away when World War II ended. I and all of your Jewish friends can assure you of that. And lately, it's become bigger, louder. I don't think non-Jewish people realize it let alone know what to do to help. So allow me. Remember in history class when the teacher would show us propaganda posters from decades, even centuries ago, and we would say, wow, those are so obviously horrible. It's so obviously conveying a dangerous message. How could anyone let this happen? And our teachers had to insist, though it seems obvious to us now, people did in fact shrug it off. And we know what that led to. Fast forward to today, I believe our modern-day version of propaganda posters are dog whistles that circulate on social media. A dog whistle is basically propaganda that not only hides, but also thrives in plain sight. A lot of them will take the formula of a popular meme, but inject it with a sly dash of dog whistle. That way, when it's called out by the person or group being targeted by it, the user can just say, What? Nah, don't read into it like that. Or they'll pass it off as, it's just a meme. Don't be so sensitive. But I'll bet you 10 gilts I've already eaten that you have come across a dog whistle before. I mean, who hasn't procrastinated doing their homework by reading ridiculous conspiracy theories on Wikipedia till 2 in the morning? You know, the stupid ones like how Mark Zuckerberg, Beyonce, and other powerful people or celebrities are secretly lizard people, and they have exclusive meetings where they wear cloaks, do secret handshakes, and drink fruit punch they stole from children. But lo and behold, that is a dog whistle. That was like an orchestra of dog whistles. On the surface, those sentiments sound like the perfect LOL XD random meme content. Because they're so ridiculous, right? Who would believe that? The thing is, though, these all originate from a very harmful piece of anti-Jewish propaganda written in 1903 called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Jewish people, unfortunately, know this document very well. So hearing anyone make light of these conspiracy theories is... A major red flag. If you want to learn more about it, you can check out the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's encyclopedia, which is linked in the description below. 
Now, of course, you could use one of these unknowingly, and that doesn't make you a horrible, irredeemable person. I mean, I've used dog whistles before without even realizing it, and I'm Jewish, but that's the problem. If you aren't aware what dog whistles are in current circulation, you could unknowingly use them, pass them on to others, and alienate your Jewish friends. Or worse, put them in danger, as speaking up in an environment rampant with dog whistle users would force them to out themselves to very dangerous people. There's an awesome TikTok creator named Zara Zahava who's really good at breaking down the origins of old and new dog whistles in bite-sized videos. I highly suggest you head to her page whenever you have a second. I'm sure you'll learn something new. Because I can assure you, every time you brush off a dog whistle as just a joke, you lose a Jewish friend and gain a Yahtzee! Oh, sorry to interrupt with my game of Yahtzee, a dice game made in 1956 by Milton Bradley. That's another thing. If you use TikTok, you know it's kind of hard to talk about this stuff online since words like that are understandably considered naughty words, and you'll get in trouble for using them. And although that censoring system means well, helpful educational content like this sometimes gets wrongfully flagged and punished because they use that naughty word. So although I can't say this word on this platform as it would risk my video getting removed, and I will be placing a sponsor on this video to ensure my awesome team gets paid should this video be demonetized, words like this need to be said out loud in real life. And if you think my situation is bad, that's nothing compared to what Jewish people who are more open about their identity have to deal with. I've had friends tell me how they've been harassed, stalked, literally hunted down and attacked by strangers in broad daylight because they're Jewish. Yes, World War II is over, but anti-Jewish ideals are thriving. They've just evolved with the times and we need to catch up. That's why I'm making this video. Being Jewish should be a happy experience and a peaceful existence. Everyone I've gotten to know so far in this journey has been nothing but welcoming. When a friend's mom found out I was Jewish, she sent me home with enough kugel to feed a horse. <laughs> and a bunch of my Jewish friends and fellow Jewish creators helped me construct this video. One of them being Raven from TikTok, Raven Reveals, and I'll have links to everyone's social media below. Thank you for watching my videos, especially this one, and as always, stay safe. Lastly, it's time I give a huge thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. There's a lot of stuff I talked about in this video that I encourage you to research, but it might look a little suspicious in your browsing history. And the last thing you want is an ad popping up thinking you'd be interested in some sketchy World War II memorabilia. That's where Surfshark comes in. A VPN from Surfshark will make sure that your city, country, and internet history are not linked to your identity. It does this by providing your computer, your phone, anything you want really, with a little virtual mask by swapping your device's IP address with a different one. That way, all the information sent between your device and the internet stays encrypted, private, and protected from big companies who see what you click on, sell your data to marketing teams, who then place those very suspicious ads in front of you, as well as hackers looking to gain access to your personal information. And they often do this through shared Wi-Fi networks, you know, like at your local coffee shop. And Surfshark never monitors, tracks, or stores what you do online. But if you're not the type to Google weird things at 2am, a VPN also allows you to access media from streaming services that are normally region locked. For example, if there's a Netflix show that's only available in the UK, your computer can put on a little British VPN and pip pip cheerio, you're good to go. That sounds more Australian. So if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, use my link surfshark.deals/illimation if you'd like to try surfshark for free for 3 months which will be right at the top of the description of this video and after downloading surfshark you can check out all the links to everything i talked about in this video without fearing you'll get a knock on your door from the fbi sponsors like these allow me to pay my awesome team and keep making serious topic videos that you like to watch so thank you again to surfshark vpn for sponsoring this video